Hi, welcome back. I am your host, Sonia Cotto, CRNA, aka nurse anesthesiologist and co-founder practitioner of Ketamine and Wellness Clinic of South Florida. We're here again at Psychedelic Healing, where we intersect psychedelics with traditional medicine to educate, empower, and find true healing for the mind, body, and spirit. I am so honored to have Dr. Joseph Lichter here with me today. He is a professor, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at FIU of Florida International University, where he also serves as the director of the Pre-Health Advising Office. He teaches three psychedelic courses and is the faculty advisor for the FIU Psychedelics Club. Isn't that amazing? A psychedelics club. Wow. He is the president of the Psychedelic Educators Network and also is a volunteer with the Open Foundation. He was one of the organizers for the first ever Cannabis Psychedelics Education Conference held at FIU, uh, hosted the Canadelic this past summer in 2022. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sonia. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, I was actually uh, privileged to meet you at that conference. So it was a really uh, amazing experience and I was glad to uh, be there. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that work. Yeah, thank you for presenting and being a part of it. You know, you mentioned the Psychedelic Club and I think it's really, it's really funny because the first iteration of my course I suggested to the students, uh, I said, you know, the university has these opportunities to start a club. I said, you would get $500 from the university for whatever kind of activities you wanted. And yeah, that never, that wouldn't exist 20 years ago when I was an undergrad. So the students took me up on it and, and they did great things. They had hosted a lot of excellent speakers and we put together that conference last summer and the university supported it, which is great. Yeah. My first question is, how did you bring psychedelics into a university to study? Yeah. Yeah. I want to I point out and give immediate attention to a network that now exists called the Psychedelic Educators Network, and it is starting to pop up in more and more universities. It's, it's growing you know alongside the the growing amount of research and also clinical stuff that's that's uh, harboring around um, psychedelics and mental health I started the course because the Honors College at FIU was looking for new courses to teach and I proposed it presented it to the curriculum uh, team and and they agreed that the rigor was a um, you know sufficient level for the Honors College students and I also knew that by working with specifically the honors college students that I would be able to kind of address the the seriousness of the issue, not just, you know, hype it or just um, surface discussion, but I could really get in the, the history, um, the, the ethics, the sordid 20th century history with, you know, prohibition and, and the Renaissance now, but also the issues that sort of arise with the Renaissance now, you know, at the pace at which we're we're seeing things change, um, the various models of change, the medicalization, you know, versus decriminalization. Um, so I started in honors three years ago, and the liberal studies department just requested that we put something in there for them, and it'll be a different student body, but the two courses that will exist will be one on fundamentals and then one on current events today. So it'll reach a broader audience than just the honors students. And and do you cover like, as a chemistry professor, do you go deep into the biochemistry of it and where it acts on the brain and the body? For students, it's it's really a funny thing. I've heard some students say that my course on psychedelics was their gateway drug to wanting to learn organic chemistry, you know, because you take organic chemistry, you don't really have a connection to it. But if for some reason you are motivated to understand what, you know, what does serotonin look like and why are these drugs that are very serotonin like, you know, creating this wild experience, it forces you to kind of understand the, the receptor binding process and and the cascade of signals that can happen so beautiful are a lot of your students kind of going more in depth into the field of research is that that your ultimate goal in this you know my my ultimate goal as an educator is to cultivate within the student their strengths 
Many years ago, my grandmother told me, she said, you know, very heavy Ukrainian accent. She's like, Joey, not everybody is going to like your classes uh, because I started as a chemistry teacher and, you know, most people don't really like chemistry. So some of my students have decided that, you know, they enjoyed learning about psychedelics and that was kind of one semester and they're done. But others have got into, um, you know, looking for research public health research. Some of them are really considering psychiatry as a you know pathway in medicine because they're starting to recognize that if the legalization occurs, that it will really see itself, you know, in the psychiatric uh, domain and and really they would be the ability, you know, the folks able to um, prescribe, you know, whether it be MDMA or psilocybin. So yeah, the students. I've seen some students too that are, you know, just curious. They just they just want to be able to discuss things in an academic manner. So, right, and that's actually really why I'm here because of that res- renaissance. You know, there's so many patients that I've come across now that are looking into the alternate psychedelics. I personally work with ketamine, you know, which is is legal, and as the other ones are starting to become legalized soon in the next year or two there are dangers with not being educated with it. So I I love the fact that you have these classes and these college students are learning. You know, are you teaching them dosing and appropriate medication um, considerations within those courses? Yeah, yeah. So ketamine is very interesting. In my first iteration of teaching the course, I did not even cover it because ketamine is very atypical in that chemically it's not very similar to LSD or psilocybin or DMT. You know, it's one of these NMDA receptor um, uh, binding molecules instead of the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor molecule um, binding. You know, it was not until the, the students brought it to class and they started saying, what about ketamine? What about ketamine? And we, we started to really get into this question of what defines something as psychedelic it's really a neat thing in the classroom that the students brought it to my attention that we need to discuss the broad classification of psychedelics. Um, you know, ketamine um, has great, as you, you're you probably more aware of it than I am, but great acute effects. Uh, I would mention, you know, this bravado uh, is one of the only, I think it is the only FDA regulated psychedelic at this point. And for good reason that the results are really showing um Great, great outcomes with uh, treatment-resistant depression. You know, the students in my classes are trying to learn so much. When you ask me, do we cover dosage in particular? I think um, we'll have conversations about, you know, what constitutes um, therapeutic dosages for all of the psychedelics and sort of in each one individually. You know, we really get into a lot about microdosing in in the psilocybin and LSD discussions, uh, largely because it's still an area that is un- under a lot of investigation. You know, I'm I'm going to be honest and say with ketamine, I've had to learn a lot more. I didn't know as much when I started because I was more versed in the serotonin um, molecules like LSD, DMT, and psilocybin and all the tryptamines, really, but would love to have you come talk to class anytime you want uh, and share some of the firsthand experience, which I think I got to say, this is probably the biggest part, you know, being a professor today, especially it's not about imparting my wisdom, but it's like connecting, you know, the students with people who are engaged in this space. So, so I've brought people in to talk about uh, ketamine, people to talk about, um, being a psychedelic journalist and um, being a psychedelic ethicist and a variety of different, you know, um, uh, individuals in the professional world of psychedelics that are helping the students see, you know, all the different domains. Possibilities are endless with psychedelics. And I admit that I don't know everything. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a field that I grew up studying since I was in college. You know, it's, it's, when I was in college, you didn't have courses on it. Uh, you really learned people who had more experience or listening or reading books or um, 
you know, it was not, it was not available in an academic setting. It was really a lot of mentors and people that you would meet much of it underground. So now the recognition that, you know, psychedelics aren't, um, they're, they're not uh, agents of, of, of danger and, 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 you know, ethically wrong. Now the, the space to discuss them in an academic setting allows, you know, these new possibilities to find, you know, modalities that can help people really. But you're still kind of in that limbo of, you know, how much of your personal experience can you talk about? How much recommendation can you do? Because it is still considered illegal. So how, how are you working around that? How are you bringing in, are you bringing in others to educate them for you? Because, you know, you're kind of in this, you are in the professor role, but how do you safely educate patients on something that they shouldn't be doing because it's illegal, but you know that they're doing, right? So this is a really interesting question and it goes back to me mentioning this educators network. That's one of the topics we talk about within this network of educators today is, you know, how do you address the elephant in the room, the legality? Um, You know, all you need is one parent who is furious at the fact that their student is learning about psychedelics to, to call up the university and, and request a, a review of this professor. Some educators are psychedelically out of the closet. You know, they're, they're letting it, they're, they're not, they're not um, keeping it um, withheld from the students. You know, me personally, I have always, in almost any class, wanted to keep my distance from from any sort of personal opinion on the material because I don't I know the power of the educator the, the person in front of the room you know who's older and and has the the space to speak more and the authority in the room can sometimes end up being you know the person that they look to copy so my I'm very cautious with that. I really want the students to read and watch and engage and write and come up with their own opinions on the material. You know, one of the first lessons in the class is the etymology of the phrase of the word psychedelic, which, you know, most people who's probably listening to your podcast already know this, but if they don't, when LSD was first synthesized and and, and studied in the 40s, uh, Albert Hoffman, who who was the Swiss uh, chemist who who discovered this, you know, he thought he was having a psych a psychosis like experience, and so the, the the term for those drugs were psychotomimetic, you know, to to mimic psychosis. And it wasn't until the more they studied, they realized not everybody was having that. Some people were having experiences that were beautiful, that were therapeutic in some ways. They could release repressed uh, experiences. They shifted people's um, mental states to being more, you know, less depressed, more open. Um, and so Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond um, were uh, trying to come up with a new word. Aldous Huxley, who's an author of, you know, Brave New World, Doors of Perception. He had a word, Phaneros time. And he presented it and Humphrey Osmond came up with this little rhyme that said, to fathom hell or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. It's such an important thing to teach the students because right then and there, in the word, in the phrase that develops this word, you have this idea that you can fathom hell or you can soar angelic. And if we're going to talk about psychedelic therapy, if we're going to talk about using psychedelics for anything it has to be understood even in the words definition there's this idea that it's not always angelic there is potential for hell how do you control that leads into discussions on set and setting that leads into discussions of of legal status you know i think anytime somebody is led to believe that something is you know illegal that it is wrong and, and harmful and so a lot of the ways that people view these things are still impacted by all that. So, you know, teaching this material, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty hesitant to give them my opinions. And they'll ask me, they'll say, Dr. Lichter, do you, do you think psychedelics should all be legal? Do you, have you ever done psychedelics? 
And I always say the same thing. I say, it doesn't really matter what I think. It matters what you're learning. It matters what you're finding from the readings, from what you're watching. What do you guys think? And what is your reasoning for it? And I think I frustrate some of them because of that. <laughs> but if you can understand, it's not because I don't have my own opinions. Uh, I'm frankly relatively libertarian, which, you know, I don't mind people do, should do whatever they want as long as they're not harming others. But if I say that in the classroom, uh, then the students will just, you know, mimic and copy me being able to understand, you know, maybe their own their own moral foundations and how that should shape their own belief. It's definitely a fine line. So even in my space uh, with with ketamine, you know, I have that voice and I have that control of set and setting. And then I still have patients coming in that have tried other psychedelics and have done inappropriate dosing or haven't had the right uh, sitter. You know, that is the inspiration to this podcast because it's so important if anybody, and I hope you are able to, you know, relay that to your your students, you know, always having that support and having that set and setting. Is that part of the curriculum within that space? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we've had some some guests speak directly to the students. We had um, one of my favorite people in the psychedelic space is a, a gentleman named David Nichols, who um, was the chairperson for the pharmacology department in Purdue for many years, and probably one of the world's leading experts on the the chemistry for psychedelics. And, you know, uh, it was a really honor that he would come speak to the students. And uh, one visit, students asked him and they said, Dr. Nichols, you know, why do people have a different experience between uh, psilocybin and LSD if they're structurally very similar? And his response, you know, the world's leading expert on this was that set and setting is really the biggest thing. When it comes to mushrooms, there's also a lot of other things in mushrooms other than just psilocybin. There's other tryptamines, uh, baocysteine, norcysteine, and there's other plant material that can affect the way, you know, you digest and, and, and metabolize. But altogether, the, the biggest uh, determinant for for positive outcomes really is you know your mindset. Are you are you open to the experience? Are you uh, are you not going with the flow and fighting it? Uh, and also your surroundings. Are you you know are you at Miami Ultra Fest where there's you know thousands of people crammed into a tiny space, or are you um, sitting with a trusted loved one or somebody who has experience in guiding others and and working with your intentions. Completely, it's a very important topic in the course. Um, there's not very many drugs out there that matter how you take them. You, know, you have a headache, you take aspirin, add ultra, you take aspirin with one person around, it's going to do the same thing and your headache to go away. But psychedelics are so, they're so contingent on how you set your, your yourself and your surroundings that, um, it is a really important discussion. Yeah. So in the you were talking about the educators network, you know, is it among all of you that you decide that it's to be, you know, you don't describe your own personal experiences, you kind of keep that private, just remaining impartial and objective? Is that kind of the consensus when educating? I I think it's a it's an individual case by case. You know, it's it's the same with any subject. You can take the Civil War. You can have somebody who whose family grew up in the South, you know, throughout the 18th and 19th century, and and wants to share that perspective. You know, what did it mean to be a Southerner during the Civil War? Or you can have somebody who steps back and just says, you know, it doesn't really matter what my connection is with this with this, you know geographical position I, I'm in, but instead just looks at the totality. There are some, there are some, you know, educators I've met who are very informed by their own experiences. There's, there's another thing I've heard said with psychedelics, and I think it's true for me. There are some books that after you've read them, they've changed you, but you don't necessarily need to open up the book again and read it. Personally, I'm not, I'm, I'm aware 
of the power of psychedelics, but I'm not necessarily, I don't want to say that my, my teaching is informed by, you know, my own use by any say, because, you know, I'm, I'm more likely to be found running a hundred miles on the weekend than, you know, sitting around at an ayahuasca uh, ceremony, but it does not necessarily mean that I don't, you know, uh, recognize the, the importance of these compounds and, and, and find them important to teach about. Young people today have a very different um, have a different way of learning than we did, you know. And I'm I'm including you here, Sonia, but maybe there's a little bit of an age difference. I don't know, uh, but you know, we didn't have the constant cell phone buzzing and 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 the just the the speed of things. I, I remember sitting in libraries and when I when I went to undergrad and reading a book. I didn't have a cell phone, so I wasn't, you know, I didn't have a laptop. We had one computer. We had two computers in the front of the library where you had to stand and wait if you wanted to check your email. This was like 1998. But so I, you know, I could really sit with the material and, and, and you know, marinate on whatever I was reading. And, and because students are doing things differently now, there's like, a, I think there's a great responsibility on educators to... Uh, try to help students find ways to, to you know, deeply think on things and not just surface think. You know, I, I guess I, I think about what I see from my students where, you know, they're very influenced by what they're reading, you know, reading on TikTok or Instagram and instead of reading like a whole book about something. And so part of my job as an educator is to like, okay, Let's let's spend some time reading the original research articles. Let's read Richard Schulte's Plants of the Gods, or um, we've been reading a really great book. I'm going to share it. I'm going to pull it off the the shelf so I can show it to you. Actually, there's a few. I'll share two of them. This one's called American Trip by Ido Hardikson. Uh, set and setting um, and the psychedelic experience in the 20th century, which is an excellent historical account of psychedelia in the in the Americas, really in the U.S., um, but also in Europe. And then also we'll visit Dan Groff um, and some of his work. Um, I pull a lot of his readings, but you know some of these original. Well, some of these original 20th century voices on psychedelics. We dig deeply into that. So I, I digress a little bit from the original question about, you know, are, are the educators open with, you know, everybody is that sort of a thing. I think everybody's going to be teaching these things differently. I'm just, I'm a little bit hesitant to become, you know, the someone they mimic and more so someone that helps them find themselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. And then Graf, that book is amazing. That is a wonderful, wonderful book. So I think even just sharing those resources of really the trailblazers that have, you know, done the work despite, I mean, they were, they were lucky because it was, you know, LSD was legal when he was able to start the research on that. So, you know, a lot of the, the older uh, researchers had the benefit of that, but we'll be able to really, you know, those that are curious and wanting to learn more is really able to just find it in those, those authors, right? Um, yeah, and I want to also kind of you know make mention of Richard Schultes as well. You know, who was this early ethnobotanist from the 20th century, and a lot of his work was to show that there were these cultures that were playing with plants and and getting so much out of it. Um, not so many of these cultures documented it, you know, in in books that were uh, accessible to the you know Western, you know, Western Hemisphere, but. That's important for the students to realize too, is that psychedelics, you know, did not just start with the synthesis of MDMA and LSD. The presence of these compounds have been here for thousands and thousands of years since the dawn of man. And what does that mean? You know, it's important to kind of, I do think there's a lot of people in the psychedelic space that really are, you know, they idolize the researchers today, you know, you go to these events and you hear Paul Stamets and Rick Doblin and, and everybody wants to hear them. They're so excited. And what they're really excited about is seeing somebody who's popular around them, but they're not, you know, Rick Doblin didn't 
make MDMA or, or, or Paul Sanders didn't make, you know, um, psilocybin. These things have been around for a long time. MDMA is, it's a synthetic, but you know, there are, um, other psychedelics that, um, have been used by cultures for so long that we really, um, need to consider that in the, the whole story. Yes. Yes. But I will defend them in that they are doing the hard work to actually become and get it legalized, you know? So there is that link of the history and it's always been there, but now they're providing it and bring it out, you know, for the mass public because it is so healing and it's going to transform mental health, you know? And that's, that's why I'm here. Even, even though there's this argument with ketamine, right? Ketamine, is it really a psychedelic? And my argument is it, it's mind altering, right? It is, you can go within your subconscious and really provide healing. And, you know, with, with any of the psychedelics, that's what we want is really expanding our mind and growing and healing. You know, there's so many people suffering and, you know, the chemistry of all the antidepressants and all these things that have failed so many people. And while it helps some, there's still so many millions of people suffering. So I am so excited about this the opportunity and then your students are already learning about it. Imagine the knowledge that they can spread to others and how to do it safely. And I love it. You're yeah. I, I, I think one of the things that I'm most proud about is it's what I see my students do on their own. You know, they, they're hosting events, they're getting into the community, they're connecting with other clubs and helping to educate. So it, it is this, you know, pay it, pay it forward type thing. And again, you know, like I mentioned early in the in talking with you, that there is a balance. I, I don't think there's any individual psychedelic that's better than others. So I, I don't I don't discount at all that ketamine has this mind alteration ability that it's also shown great results with treatment resistant depression. So I believe strongly that every psychedelic has, you know, its inherent uh value. There's also an importance in understanding anything that is the risk side of things, the health side of things, you know, any of the issues uh, that exist with dosage and uh, with addiction potential, you know, con contra uh, indications, you really have to see the full picture. You know, when I talk to my students about psychedelics, I do ask them, and honestly, how many of them have used a psychedelic? And this past you know semester, we saw about half the class had experiences, and you know, knowing what they brought to the table in terms of uh, knowledge, they didn't have much until they you know, until the class when I mean, they they had experience. They didn't have a lot of knowledge on some of the things that you know are are critical, pharmacology, the the history. So I think. There's there's definitely a way to to you know and how to say this. There's definitely young people that are trying psychedelics, but there's not enough young people that are studying psychedelics. So the those that are studying are hopefully helping to transmit important you know information, um, appreciation, uh, respect. Well, as we're kind of nearing the end, I did still have a one more question. Uh -oh. um, my, I don't know how if you can even make it this a short answer, but uh, what would you say to a student that comes to you um, looking for where where they would go for a psychedelic experience? How what would you recommend for them? Like questions to ask as far as like safety, right set and setting. So number one, um, psychedelics are illegal in the state of Florida. You know, I always make sure they understand that. You know, access is an issue. There is certain, there are cities in the country that are more psychedelic friendly that are decriminalized. So places like um, Colorado and Oregon and some cities like DC and Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, Santa Cruz, Oakland, um, out there, if they were accessing um mushrooms or psilocybin it would be legal it would be decriminalized it wouldn't be fully legal i haven't had students who have asked me about what if they were interested in in utilizing a psychedelic so i've i haven't actually had to field that question yet but if i had to i would always tell them to be you know careful 
we do talk a lot about uh, the availability of testing kits that exist, you know, especially for anything that's going to be synthetic. I would be skirting a very, you know, important line of, of, of legality and safety. I would, I would probably have them consider places where, you know, overseas where it's, you know, more, more likely to be legal, right? The truffles in Amsterdam, you know, I, I did, you know, here's the story. I went to, um, the international conference on psychedelic research with my students it was some of my students in Amsterdam. They were overseas in, in, in Europe. And I told them, you know, you do as you please. And, you know, I, I'm not, uh, condoning nor, nor, uh, encouraging anything that, um, is outside of your comfort zone. But, um, you know, these are young people that will make the decisions that are best for them. Um, I just want them to be smart, uh, know, you know, what they're taking if they are. And, and yeah, just safety above everything, you know, safety in terms of legality, safety in terms of knowing what the compound is and the right dosage at all. Yeah. Perfect. Good answer. Yes. And I would say, I know it's not like the cool thing, but I would always caution others to always have somebody that is, I guess, a sitter or uh, somebody that's not utilizing the medicine because it's always good to have somebody that can be there for support just in case you have a bad experience for, for some. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I do besides this is, is do a lot of ultra running. And whenever you run, you know, hundred miles or 200 miles, people have a crew. And I think you need to have a crew if you're going to embark on, on a psychedelic experience. So I am fully agreeing with you, Sonia. Perfect. Yeah. You never know what you're going to find when you dig deep. <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Lecter. It was very, very much a pleasure and an honor to finally get to talk to you one-on-one -on -one outside of the conference. So, Thank you, Sonia. And I'm really excited for this new podcast and I'm going to share it with my students and uh, hopefully we'll um, get a lot of good speakers to come talk to you. Perfect. And if anybody's interested in learning more about psychedelics and you live in Florida, you want to go to FIU, he has uh, some amazing classes and you can dig deep and learn lots. Yeah, just email me my first initial, my last name, jlichter at fiu.edu, and I'll let you know when the classes are and feel free to come take them. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you, everyone. And until next time, have a good night.